he starts out <coughs> talking about substance. This is section three. And he says, that universal conception which is nearest to sense is that of the present in general. This is a conception because it's universal. So we're just talking about the present in general. And he says that that's the closest to sense, to sense impressions. So if we had the manifold, the multiplicity on the top, he's calling the present in general, that's, that's what that is. That sense impression is just everything that's present to you right now. Right? And there's no specificity there because there's, he's saying it's, well, let's read the next se section. He says, but as the act of attention has no connotation at all, but is the pure denotative power of the mind, that is to say, the power which directs the mind to an object in contradistinction to the power of thinking any predicate of that object. Um, let me pause there. <laughs> okay, so that he's saying, when he says connotation, he's using a philosophical meaning of connotation, and he said, which means that it's, it's like a common noun, which is to say that um, if you refer to something as having a connotation, that means it's, it's defining a, a general category of things, right? So in a sense, it's defining a set of attributes that all those things have. When he says denotation, he says he's referring to the proper noun function of a word, right, that just refers to one specific thing just by naming that thing. It's not actually pointing out any attributes of that thing. It's just, it's a proper noun, right? So whatever, UC Irvine, we call it UC Irvine because that's the thing. There's no, there's, it's the proper noun, right? So <coughs> he says that in the act of attention, when we're just focusing on the present in general, this act of attention is only an act of denotation. We're just pointing to the present in general. We don't have any attributes that we're using in order to sort of name the present as a, as a common noun. As, as, as a set of attributes to which these objects belong. So, and that makes sense, right? Because if you're just saying the present now in general, then you've, you've got no attributes. It's just whatever is present to us, right? There are no attributes. It's just, we're just denoting it. We're just referring to the present, right? And so that act of attention to the present then, because it has no attributes, well, he says, so the conception of what is present in general, which is nothing but the general recognition of what is contained in attention, has no connotation and therefore no proper unity, right? So because it has, we don't have any attributes, it's not a common noun, it's just the present in general, there's no unity to it. There's no way in which we can say, oh, this is something that we've named that that we could name in the future and we would know what it is. Because every time you name the present in general, it's going to be a different present, obviously. And so there's no connection between this present and you know, the present just two seconds ago. It's a, it's a different present. It's, it's, just, it's a just another referring to that present. There's no, there's no unity to it. It's only sense impressions taken as a kind of multiplicity of sense impressions. Right? No unity. So that's why he says, the, when we're talking about the present in general, it's a conception, because we can conceive of the present in general, and it's a, it's a universal conception, sort of a general thing to, to say. It's closest, it's the, it's the conception that's closest to sense impressions, and it, it's the one that's farthest from unity. It has, it has no unity at all, right? It has no sense of attributes that could define what everything within our attention has in common to it, All right? So this conception, then he continues, right? And this is kind of the evidence in, in the sense that he's, he's, he's explaining to us a little bit how this works. This conception of the present in general, of it in general, is rendered in philosophical language by the word substance in one of its meanings. Before any comparison or discrimination can be made between what is present, 
what is present must have been recognized as such as it. And subsequently, the metaphysical parts which are recognized by abstraction are attributed to this it, but the it itself, but the it cannot itself be made a predicate. This it is, is thus neither predicated of a subject nor in a subject, and accordingly is identical with the conception of substance. Right? So what he's pointing out is that this present has no unit because it has no connotation, and it has no attributes, just what we were, we were saying before. And he's pointing out here then, if, if we refer back to Hadar, that Hadar's example of the sheep is actually not just the sheep. Because if we recall, Hadar was saying, well, the sheep bleats. And when, when, when the, as soon as Hadar says the sheep bleats, it's not just substance anymore. It's not just it anymore. It actually has, it has a predicate to it. It has, it has an attribute. So if you recall, Hatter was saying that, that the, the, the person who chose the distinguishing mark for the sheep chose it because he found an attribute of the sheep, which is this bleeding. And the moment you find an attribute, you've gone beyond that present in general. You've gone beyond just the pure substance. And that's what Peirce is indicating here, right? That, he's, that, that, that subject and attribute is what it takes to create that reduction of the manifold to the unity, and that the substance itself can't do it by itself. Right? So that just referring to the present in general, you can't create that kind of unity. Right? Um, I'll, I'll just wait on the we'll just wait till the, the questions. Okay? So <coughs> so that's the, the first conception that he's giving us, which is substance, and which is just this reference to the present in general. So that's on the one side he's got. Substance is the first conception. The other conception that he's going to start out with is, is called being, and it's, it, that's what completes the reduction of the manifold to unity. So he says here in section four, the unity to which the understanding reduces impressions is the unity of a proposition. So this is what we just said. This unity consists in the connection of the, predi of the predicate with the subject. Right? So, and therefore, that which is implied in the copula, and the copula is the, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the verb to be, essentially, right? Or the conception of being is that which completes the work of conceptions of reducing the manifold to unity, right? So the unity is created in a sentence which links the subject to the predicate, and it's that linking that creates then the proposition which creates this linking of the manifold to the unity. And so he's saying that in order to do this, you need what he calls the copula, which is the, the word to be, being, to be, right? Because that's what creates the link. It's what creates the link between subject and predicate, right? So he says the copula, rather the verb, which is copula in one of its senses, means either actually is or would be. As in the two propositions, there is no griffin, and a griffin is a winged quadruped, right? So in both cases, there is this word is in there. And any sentence that has a subject and a verb has implied within it that, that copula, that is, right? The conception of being contains only that junction of pred predicate to subject wherein these two verbs agree. The conception of being, therefore, plainly has no content. So what he's saying here, right, is that to the creation of unity requires this linking of subject and predicate. The linkage itself, he's calling being, right, that's the linkage. And he's saying that that linkage has no content at all. You can just have the linkage without having any content of the linkage. You just, it's, a, it's a structure of relationship. Pure, uh, pure relationship, and he gives us a, and he gives us this example. He, he says, if we say the stove is black, the stove is the substance from which its blackness has not been differentiated, and the is, while it leaves the substance, substance just as it was seen, explains its confusedness by the application to it of blackness as a predicate. Right. So we have. So he's got. Basically, he says, when, when you have this, this sentence, the stove is black, you've got three pieces. You've got the stove, you've got the blackness, and you've got the is that links the two. And what's going on is that you've got the stove kind of as, 
you could sort of say it's the substance, but it's already, it's, it's already more than substance because you, you've already d defined a, a, a common noun. But in linking it up to the blackness, that is creates the proposition, which then creates the, the unity in a sense, right? So, so that he's saying that that is, is a specific function, uh, which is the function of creating unity. And it has no content, it's just the is, and it's itself a conception. That's the last conception of, in creating unity, right? So he's got this second argument in the middle. And so, so there's the main argument that in which being is that which completes the creation of unity, right? Uh, and the reason is that you need a sentence, you need to, to link a subject to predicate to create that unity, and the evidence is that example of the stove. And he's got this, whatever, the, the other part is that secondary argument in which the conception of being, therefore, has no content. So, this, so he's, there's really, there's two arguments. Being completes the creation of unity, and then the other claim is that being has no content, right? So it's the farthest away you can get from substance, because substance is all content and no structure, right? So, so what we get then is we get on, on the top, you know, where the manifold is, he has substance, right? It's just the present in general, right? Which has no structure to it, has no attributes, but it's just the present in general that you can refer to denotatively, which is just as referring to it. On the bottom you have being, which is that linkage <laughs> between subject and predicate has no content at all, it just has linkage. And in between, he says, we've got to somehow bridge that gap between the being, which is all, it's the unity, it's the linkage, has no content, and the substance, which is all content but has no, no attributes, right? How do you get from here to there, right? How do you create that linkage, right? So that's, that's the problem he's set up for. But, he, but he's given us, you know, the, the two endpoint conceptions. Right? So he's got the one conception of substance uh, <coughs> with the manifold and the other conception of being with the unity. Right? And now he's got to fill in um, the gap in between. Right? Um, so just to sum this up for a moment, consciousness reduces impressions to unity in the proposition. So the proposition, the sentence, is, is, the, is where the impressions are reduced to unity. Recall Hobbes said something similar, right? He says that truth must consist of linking a subject to a predicate, right? That's a, this is the same thing. You can't have truth without that linkage of subject to predicate, right? The copula is this concept of being that, that creates the link, and that's the, you know, that, that's the end point at the bottom, right? The conception of being therefore creates a, creates a relationship but no, has no content. And we had the example of the stove is black. He further says that being does not affect the subject, but has an indefinite determinability of the predicate. So he, he gave this example. Uh, you, you said, what, what was it? it was, is, you, you could have a predicate. Is a, what was it? Is a long-tailed animal or something like that? And you could have that, just that predicate, and it could just be a floating predicate that you could attach to anything. And you can even have a predicate that attaches to an indeterminate subject, right? So you could say there is a, so when you say there is a long-tailed animal, you're saying that there, that you've got this predicate that attached to, to some undefined subject, right? And so, so these predicates determine something. There, it's, there's a determination in the predicate that you don't have in the subject, and that determination can float around. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a predicate that can be attached to all these different subjects, right? And so he's saying then that finally also that the substance is inapplicable to predicate, that, that predicate has no substance. There's no, there's no presentness to the predicate, right? The, you know, when, when you're talking about substance, it's, the, it's what's present now it's present it's present there or it's 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 it in general the predicate doesn't have that because it can float around is a long-tailed thing is a long-tailed animal it can just kind of float it it doesn't have that presence to it on the other hand 
a substance can't have a predicate. It doesn't have attributes. Um, because if it had attributes, it would be a predicate. Right? It, it's the present in general. There's, there are no attributes. There's no predicates to that. Right? And so that's, why, that's how he knows that those are sort of these universal and elemental conceptions, because each one excludes the other one. All right?